Last time on transistors, we looked at our pulse detector. We saw how by just using a capacitor in our circuit, we were able to turn a long button press into a short momentary pulse. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be applying that to a circuit to actually use the pulse as a clock. You're watching another episode of Transistors. Hello and welcome back to Transistors. Now, think back to episodes where we did the bistable multivibrator. That's a mouthful, I know. Um, but, well, essentially, that component stored a little bit of information. To be exact, one bit of information that we could toggle on or off. In Gates terms, uh, another sort of circuit that does this is our RS knowledge, as we've seen in that episode. Now, that is sort of useful in its own way, but there are clocked versions of this component that can be even more useful and yeah, can actually provide more functionality. The problem, of course, is that they are not stable and that's why they require a clock pulse to maintain that stability. What we'll be looking at today primarily will be the T flip flop. So let's take a look at the circuits for our T flip flop. Now, this simulation is actually not running. It's in a pause state and I'm going to be stepping ahead a little bit at a time. And we'll see why that is in a second. Now, notice that we have what is essentially an RS NOR latch in the middle. However, it is quite a bit more complex now because there are two additional AND gates. And the output from our NOR gates are sort of being looped back to our AND gates. So, it's a bit complex, but we'll see why that is in a second. Now, watch what actually happens if I let this circuit run by itself. I'm going to toggle both circuits on, and I'm going to just tell Logisim to go and simulate the circuit. It immediately stops. It says that there is an oscillation going on. Now, let's try and actually step our way through just to sort of force this circuit to work, and we'll see what happens. Now, what I'm doing is I'm manually pushing the circuits forwards, and as you can see, what's happening is there is sort of this chain of steps causing, well, the circuit to oscillate between its two states. As you can see, it's never ending, and that is what it means by oscillation. The circuit is not stable. So, that is why we need to have a clock, because once the clock goes away, even if the toggle pin actually stays high, the circuit can settle into one of its two states. Now, I'm continuing to press the forward button, but nothing happens because, well, the clock isn't pushing it forwards, right? So this end gate doesn't actually kick off. Now, let's say the clock comes on momentarily, right? I'm going to step the simulation forward by two steps, and its state is going to propagate through over here. Now, the clock pulse is going to fall away, and that allows the circuit to take its time to settle into its next state, and it stays there. So that's why we need to have a clock pulse in this particular context. What we're going to do is we're going to build this exact circuit, and we are going to implement our clock pulse such that it is sort of momentary. We're going to use what we've learned from last time with our pulse detector to do this. So yeah, that's basically a roadmap of what we're going to be building for today. Now, we could have built the actual gate uh, using our transistors, but I've decided to you know, simplify that part a little. I actually went out, I actually got two IC chips that contains our AND gates as well as our NOR gates, which are used to build you know, the sort of RS knowledge part of it, as well as the switching part on the outside to handle the pulse detection. So let's first see the schematic on how to hook that up. Once we have that nice and working, we can bring our pulse detector circuit into play. Let's start by taking a look at the IC chips we will be using. This is a 7411 IC, and what it does as well, it implements AND gates for us. So that saves us a little bit of trouble. These are actually three inputs AND gates. So there are three of them in this package, we're only going to use two. But yeah, these would work nicely because they take in three inputs, exactly what we need. So they are laid out in this pattern, right? We'll be using these four pins and these four pins. Three inputs, one output, like so. 
Same deal for the NOR gates. Now, these are two input NOR gates, so there are four of them within this package. Again, we will only be using two of them. So yeah, we will be laying out the two IC chips like this. Of course, just as a little footnote, these two IC chips are actually oriented in opposite directions. Notice that for this, the notch is on the left, for this, the notch is on the right. And this was done, well, deliberately. Because I wanted all my gate outputs to face the right. So yeah, just a little design note, right? Do note that I have done this for my own convenience. So alright, we have our gates in place. Now it's time to actually set everything up. Now, this one could be a little bit confusing, which is why we're going to constantly refer back to our schematic. So this is the schematic you've seen from earlier. Let's now try and implement it bit by bit, starting from that little cross bit in the center. Essentially, all we're doing is we're taking the output of one NOR gate and pointing it to the input of the other, and vice versa. So it's just a little cross like this, that's all we need to do. Now, of course, for the sake of simplicity, I'm drawing these lines inside the chip. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're trying to make a connection within the chip itself. On an actual breadboard, the wires will of course jump over the chip. But we're doing this to keep things just a little bit neater. So let us move on again. Now, let's move on to the two outputs from the AND gates. They have an output that goes over to their corresponding NOR gates like so. And as a result, all we really need to do is to connect the output to the input. Output to input. That's it. Next, we have these two large loopbacks which are basically the outputs from the NOR gates going back to their corresponding AND gates. So, all we have to do is to hook it up like so. Output to input, output to input. So far so good, I hope you're not too confused. Let's move on again. Now, of course, we want to be able to see our outputs, which is why these two outputs now go towards whatever it is we want to use to show that. Um, in our case, it will be LEDs, of course. Next, all we are left with are our two inputs, namely the clock and toggle inputs, which of course feed our AND gates. Since these are shared, it's fairly easy to do. We have our clock pulse coming in here to one AND gate, and we will of course simply tap the signal across to the other terminal as well. Same deal for our toggle input. Go into one side, tap it over to the other. Of course, on paper, that's all we need. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to experiment with here are our clock pulses. So let's delve into a little bit more detail when it comes to our clock. And to do that, of course, I have got to sort of zoom out the whole image. Let's now build our clock circuit. Now, we will not actually be building a clock that ticks at regular intervals. Instead, we will generate our own pulse using a switch. I think you've seen this switch enough throughout the series, so I'm not going to explain it too much. But what we're doing now is a capacitor-less version. What this means is the moment you press down a switch, a high state goes into the chip and it stays there. Clearly, this is not great because what's going to happen is, well, the circuit is going to start to oscillate. We want to slow things down by putting a capacitor in line with it. So here is our capacitor. It has its own pull-down resistor to give it a chance to drain out. And its output goes towards the two clock pins. So this is our entire clock circuit. Whenever I press down upon this button, it's going to go through the capacitor, generate just a very short pulse, and send that through to our end gates. So that's how it all works in theory. Hopefully this entire diagram isn't too, too confusing. Now we can move on to our breadboard and see just how much worse this looks in the real world. So here is our completed circuit, kind of. Now, let's take a look at what we have here. Firstly, I am powering this using an Arduino. The reason for this is because these two chips require 5 volts for input. Usually what I'm using is two AAA batteries, which is about 3 volts, give or take. So yeah, I'm now using an Arduino. It's only there as a power source, so let's pretend it's not part of the equation. Now, what we see next is a huge tangle of cables. So I'm not going to sort of go into too much detail about how things are connected. What's more important to note is that this is our three input AND gate. 
So we're using one gate on top and one gate below. As we've seen in the schematics, over here, this is our NOR gate. Again, we're only using one gate on each side. These are our two outputs. In addition, we have our switch over here, which, well, has a capacitor right here. So the switch is being pulled down the ground via this resistor, and this resistor basically allows our capacitor to discharge. This input is being fed into one pin on each AND gate. So yeah, it's one of these three pins. Of course, another one of the pins are crossed between the two gates, as we've seen. And to make things simpler, what I've done is I've taken the last pin and just raised it up to high. What this means is basically we want to toggle all the time. And all we're waiting for is a clock pulse coming in from here to make the change actually happen. Now, the more eagle-eyed among you would have realized that this isn't the same capacitor as I've been using in the previous episode. This is actually a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So it has, you know, much less capacitance. And the reason for this is because the other capacitor creates a pulse that is way too long and it creates some sort of oscillation here. In fact, this capacitor is still not really good enough because sometimes when I press down on the switch, it sort of moves this multiple times before it actually rests. So yeah, still some room for improvement, but let's just jump in to see how this works. I press the switch down and the light jumps from one side to another. I can hold down the switch if I like, it does not oscillate, right? I can hold it down again, no oscillation. It jumps to the other state and it stays there. Of course, if I were to press this enough times, eventually you will see some cases in which it doesn't really work as you think. There you go, it just sort of went twice and that's probably caused by bouncing from a poor contact. This switch is kind of wobbly, so that might be one reason. But yeah, for the most part, it does sort of work as we imagine we are able to jump from one state to the other. Of course, if I were to sort of pull out this, right, so this would be our actual toggle switch and we put it to low. No matter how much we press this button, nothing is going to happen. And that's the idea, right? No matter how many clock pulses you see, if the user hasn't told you to actually forward the state, you wouldn't. You would stay at your current state. If I were to transfer this back so it goes back to high, Notice, of course, that this change in and of itself also does not affect the state. Both the clock and the input must be high for the state to transition. So now that we have this idea, let's see why we really need the clock pulse. Now, this is the wire that feeds the clock pulse into the circuit. What I can do is I can pull this out. And if this goes high as well and it stays high, what's going to happen is technically the states are going to oscillate very quickly between the two. See, when I hold it down, you sort of see this little flashing effect where, well, the state just goes back and forth between the two lights. So yeah, the idea is as long as you hold it down, things are kind of messy. You don't really know where you're going to end up until you lift up this pin again. The moment it goes low, or in my case, disconnected, it will settle into one of the two states. And that is why we need a clock pulse. We need to make this contact with our high state as short as possible. So yeah, when we have it like this, you know, smooth out with the capacitor, everything is going to be okay. Every press of the button is going to allow the state to transition from one to the other. And there you go, that's essentially this circuit in a nutshell. Definitely very messy to look at, especially because we have two IC chips in the middle. But the general idea is fairly simple. So I guess you don't have to use this as a reference. Go back to the circuits, go back to the schematics we've seen earlier. And uh, yeah, that tends to be more helpful. And there you have it. That is our T flip flop using a pulse detector circuit, as well as two logic gate IC chips. But yeah, that's basically it. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.